Well, uh, for the next four weeks, I'm going to do a series, and the series is called, Is That Really in the Bible? <laughs> so this is a four-week series, and it's called, Is That Really in the Bible? And today we begin with uh, seven questions. Now, if you're interested in following up on these messages, uh, you can go to the author site. Uh, these are things I'm reacting to. Uh, these are things that I've been working on lately and, and polishing a bit. And so I put them on the web so that if this uh, message is not sufficient for you and you want to revisit some scriptures or revisit the questions, all of that is up on my author site. You can check that out. Uh, but we're going to deal with about seven or eight questions each week, okay? And for four weeks. So my, my hope and my prayer is that at the end of the four weeks, that we will feel like we have a more solid foundation and that all of the but what about, but what about, but what about questions uh, can find some possible answers through Scripture. So uh, this morning we're kind of going to take a bird's eye view. The first seven questions kind of back up and say, uh, you know, what's going on with this grace message? What's going on with this new covenant? Is this for real? And so the first question is, you say that the New, Test New Testament era doesn't really begin at Jesus' birth. You say Jesus was born under law and that the New Testament era began at Jesus' death. What evidence is there for your view? So you can see that uh, this is kind of a, well, it's a loaded question. There's a question being asked with a bit of emotion behind it. You say this, how can you say this? Where's the scripture for this? And the reason that it's a, such a loaded question really is because uh, we open our Bibles and we go to Matthew 1 and we assume that that is the beginning of the New Testament, which it is in terms of literature, right? The publishers have put a publisher's page there, and it says Matthew 1 is essentially the start of the New Testament. And then you start hearing words breathed about this New Testament beginning somewhere else, that it doesn't begin at the birth of Christ, but it begins at the death of Christ. And then you say, whoa, 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 what's going on? Is that for real? Or is that just some trendy movement? Or is that just some spin on, a, on some verses? Or what is the situation? And so uh, one of the landmark passages that we can look to is Galatians 4. Galatians 4 says, When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law. Okay, so stop there. Born under a, wom uh, born under a woman. Well, that's true too, right? Uh, <laughs> We're not, this is not a biology message, <laughs> but it sort of just became one. Uh, born of a woman. Okay, we know this. It, uh, it, it, it's theology 101, the virgin birth. And yet the next phrase is often overlooked, or we take our mental sharpie to it, we just, <laughs> and ignore that one for a few decades until, wow, born under law, Jesus was born under law to redeem those under law. So again, twice in this passage we have it. Twice in Galatians 4 we're told that Jesus is born under law and that his audience is born under law. So if you're going to redeem some people who are under law, what are you going to do with them? You're going to go up to them and just kind of, you know, stroke them on the back and tell them how great they're doing. Oh, I know you're just giving it your best, and that's all we ask, right? That's one approach, but it's going to lead to death because the law, it, like being under the law, is like being under a curse. It's all or nothing. It's perfectionism to the hilt. And so Jesus is not about patting people on the back, telling them they're doing their best. Have you ever noticed that? I mean... Jesus is saying out of one side of his mouth, apart from me, you can do nothing. And out of the other side, he's saying, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs, what's wrong with you people? There's never a moment of, hey, Pharisees, you're doing wonderful, love what you're about, uh, appreciate your efforts. 
let's all hang out and have a cup of tea together and discuss your success. That's not happening. And so Jesus, born under law, is talking to an audience who's under law, and he's creating a sense of desperation within them. Jesus creates a sense of desperation within people. And so you work your way through Matthew 5, for example, uh, which uh, often people teach Matthew 5 and 6 as a beautiful, wonderful, encouraging passage, but really it's a, it's a passage of death. I mean, you work your way through Matthew 5 and you're scared you're going to be thrown into hell uh, for thinking bad thoughts. You're afraid you're going to be thrown into fires for using words like you fool. Uh, you're afraid that you're going to be uh, needing to lose body parts in order to avoid uh, Hades. I mean, it's not really fun to try your best at Matthew 5 and 6. And so this is what Jesus is doing with people who are born under law. He's saying there's no hope here. The law is a dead way. I am the living way. The law is a dead way. And so then we see Hebrews 9... And Hebrews, by the way, is an absolute staple food for our church. Hebrews is sort of the very best and complete book at introducing the concept of, hey, there's a new covenant. Hey, it's different from the old covenant. The old is obsolete. The new is here. So hang on to the new. Hebrews is essential. It's critical. It's a big deal. And here we are in chapter 9, and he says... A will or a testament or a covenant is in force only when someone has died. Now notice that it doesn't say when someone is born. A covenant is not in force when someone is born. A covenant, a testament, a will is in force when someone has died. Now again, this is not just some fun grace theology that we file away in our heads for intellectualism. Don't miss the meaning. Don't miss the daddy behind the doctrine. Here's what we're saying. Right here at this cross, it's the dividing line of human history. That means a whole lot of intense stuff is happening before Jesus. And then a whole lot of grace-filled stuff is happening after Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that in the Old Testament they didn't have faith. They had faith. And I'm not saying in the Old Testament nobody was saved. Lots of people were saved by faith in a coming Messiah, in a message they didn't fully understand, in a work that was not yet finished. But here we are today, fast forward thousands of years later, and we're looking back on the finished work, not toward it. We're looking back on the finished work of Jesus Christ and we live on this side of the cross and it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome to not have to do any guessing about what was going to take place and instead celebrate what's already taken place. And so we see then that Hebrews and Galatians are basically shouting from the rooftops that it is not the birth of Christ, it is the death of Christ that brings in this wonderful new era that we call the New Covenant. So, what does this mean for you? Well, it means that you are a New Covenant believer. It sets you apart as a New Covenant, not Old Covenant, but New Covenant believer. So that you're not standing around wondering about your forgiveness, wondering, saying, please don't take your spirit from me, wondering about your heart, saying, create in me a clean heart, wondering all of the Old Testament questions, you're not there. You're in the New Testament on this side of the cross, celebrating a new heart, a new spirit, total forgiveness, and closeness to God. You're a new covenant believer. All right. So let's go to number two. Where can I find a good summary of this new covenant in Scripture? And the answer to that, you might have guessed it, is Hebrews. Now we're in Hebrews 8, not Hebrews 9, but Hebrews 8. Backing up, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time. Now people say, Well, gosh, it just says Israel, and I'm America. <laughs> so I'm not Israel, so is this new covenant for me? 
Well, you know, Corinthians takes care of that pretty well because in Corinthians, Paul is telling Greek people, okay? Maybe that's a little bit closer to you, I don't know. But Paul is telling Greek people, not Jewish people, but Greek people that they are now ministers of the new covenant, that they are qualified as ministers of this new covenant. So why is Israel targeted here? I'll tell you why. Because the book is called Hebrews. Yeah. If it were called Americans, Americans 8, verse 8 to 12, then it might say, this is the covenant I will make with America. But it's written to Israel, it's written about Israel, and it's called New Covenant because they had already had one. Now, you, as a Gentile, you never had any covenant. So we'll call it new, but we can call it new and only. Right? And so he says, this is the covenant, and here it is, I will put my laws in their minds. Okay, that's knowledge. That's wonderful. It's wonderful to know what God wants. But he goes further. I will also write them on your hearts. So it's a knowing and a wanting. So Christianity is about following a knowing and following a wanting. It is about following a person that is in our minds, the mind of Christ, and a person that dwells within our hearts. Christ poured out in our hearts by faith. And so watch out for the Christianity that is only a knowing. That's not the real full experience in Jesus. We don't run around with just sort of a knowledge of what God wants, but no real desire for it. Now this would be the person that's running around in a pity party. I know what God wants, I just, I'm wicked. I know what he wants from me, I just don't want to. And there's this conflict, head and heart. And so we're, we're sold the lie, we buy into the enemy's lie, that uh, we're halfway on board with Jesus, that we know but we don't want. Now that's a lie because the gospel is twofold in this sense. The gospel has told us we have the mind of Christ, but also he works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So he works in us to want, and he's given us a new heart. So, if you're going to sin now, think about this. If you're going to sin, if you're going to choose sin, then you're going against your mind, the mind of Christ given to you, and you're also going against your heart. And that's why you got the, the mind-heart tug. The tug of the mind and the tug of the heart, they're both sort of involved because Christ is in both places, because Christ is in you to the fullest. You know that age-old analogy, oh, you know, you gave yourself to Christ, and yeah, there's 27 rooms in your life, but you only gave him three rooms, and you need to start opening doors, and you're not opening enough doors, and maybe there's some hidden rooms, and I understand that there's habits, and there's attitudes. Let's call it, there's some old furniture in the yard. I mean, you've got an engine out there hanging from a tree. There's pink flamingos everywhere. No offense. If you've got a pink flamingo, I think that's very stylish. Very stylish. But the point is, the house has been indwelt by God, and he doesn't share. So there's a renovation going on. There's impressions. The neighbors are thinking, man, would they just trim that grass a little bit? Those hedges seem out of whack, you know? I mean, there's work to be done on the outside, attitudes and actions. But Jesus Christ indwells the house. And so he's in our minds, the mind of Christ. He's in our hearts, poured out by faith in our hearts. And then there's this last part, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Now, before we get into that, I, I need to back up and do it just service. Look what it says here. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. 
So what this is saying is it's not saying there's super Christians and, and little Christians and important Christians and unimportant Christians. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying everybody from the little kiddos all the way up to the senior citizens and everybody in between. They will all know the Lord. There will be a knowing. It's not a theology quiz. They won't be experts in every aspect of theology, but they will have a knowing, a personal knowing of the Lord. And you can't make people know the Lord. And you are not the key to people knowing the Lord. You don't march around planet Earth, you know, sort of as a, a, a mini uh, helper, a mini Messiah, getting people to know the Lord. The Lord handles that. There's this thing, there's this connection between you and the Lord that he does. And so that's why we don't have to march around making people have this connection. All of us in Christ, we know the Lord. And uh, then it goes on to talk about this forgiveness. Now this forgiveness is, I've got no record of it. I've got no record of your sins. I am not dealing with you on the basis of your sins. Uh, somebody posted last night on, on Facebook, uh, my Facebook page, a question. And the question was, well, what about someone who is a sincere Christian, who is in Christ, perhaps? Okay, we'll make up one scenario. They're in Christ. They're sincere. They're in Christ. And they're, they've got Christ in them. This relationship has started. And yet they uh, struggle with homosexual temptation. So notice that this question was pulled out of a hat. Here's the hat of sins, right? Here's the hat of sins. We've got, and I'll just quote from Paul here as I'm pulling out of this hat here. We've got uh, disobedient to parents. We've got uh, gossip. We've got envy. We've got drunkenness. We've got homosexuality. We've got lying. We've got, you see what I'm saying? It's right in there. It's in the same hat with disobedient to parents. Now, is anyone here a sterling example of obedience to parents? Would you just come forward now? Because we could fall at your feet and worship. So my point is, is this. Man, there is every flavor of flesh under the sun, and it's called sin. But Jesus didn't go picking certain sins out of the hat when he decided to die. He paid for all sins. And so when we talk about this forgiveness, it says, I will remember their sins no more. That doesn't mean I will remember some sins no more. But you see what we've done when we've got levels of sins and we pull them out of the hat and we start sorting once you start sorting, you become God. And now you're going to rank the sins. Oh, well, this one, he, he, he couldn't be, she, she couldn't be saved. I mean, a real Christian, never. Right, right. I think you know better, don't you? We all know better on some level that the flesh is capable of any kind of struggle at any moment. And so this is why Jesus does not select sins to forgive. He remembers our sins no more. Now, uh, let me say that that doesn't, that doesn't mean that God is sitting up there, you know, hands folded behind his back, and he says, well, I don't care what you do. I don't care. I don't care what you do. I'm not involved anymore. I mean, I, I sent my son, died on the cross, and uh, I don't care what you do. See, that's a total misrepresentation. That would be like tearing out select parts of the Bible and say, I'll go with those, right? But the big picture message is, I don't hold your sins against you. I don't take them into account. You receive no punishment, no condemnation for them. But I'm going to spend my life tutoring you, counseling you, comforting you, disciplining you, discipling you, growing you up, molding you, shaping you, being involved in your life because I'm your dad and I care. Now, you've never had a dad like that. I haven't. I had a wonderful dad, but not to that level. Whoa, that's a serious amount of forgiveness tied in with a serious amount of caring all in one. 
Well, next we have, you seem to be arguing that Old Covenant law that's before the cross, the Old Covenant law, is now set aside. That's strong language. What would, what would lead you to say that it's totally set aside? Hebrews 10. Notice we're in Hebrews. Oh, it's good. It's a good book. Check it out. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burn offerings and sin offerings you did not desire. You were not pleased with them. He says, I've come to do your will. Here it is. Here it is. He sets aside the first will to establish the second will. Now remember that will, testament, covenant, it's all the same word. So he sets aside the first covenant to establish the second covenant. And by that second will, by that will, we have been made holy. Amen? I know. It's controversial for us to start shouting amen. Amen? amen. Woo! Y'all are way too charismatic. All right, so he's got this situation here where he's told us pretty clearly, uh, uh, I want you, you've had two cups here, I want you to take this cup and notice that it's empty, and I want you to set it aside, okay? Now you've got this cup, and it's full, and it's overflowing, and there's life in it. There was nothing actually but death in that cup. And somebody says, uh, no, no, you don't understand. I got a lot of good use out of the law. There was a lot of good in the law. You don't understand. I'd like to drink, you know, both sides of my mouth. I'd like to drink from both, if you don't mind. There's a lot of good in the law. Well, you can have 99% juice and 1% poison and mix it all together in there. And then I offer you to drink it. I say, look, it's 99% fine. Would you like to take a sip? It's 99% juice and only 1% poison for you. It's a beautiful concoction. Chances are, I mean, who knows? You'd probably be all right. 99% juice, 1% arsenic. That's all. <laughs> How about you just enjoy this? See, James says if you keep the whole law and you stumble in one point, you're guilty of all of it. You could do 99 things right, stumble in one, and you better not be drinking from that law cup. And so the Bible tells us to set aside the old way and drink from the new because it's a cup that is full and overflowing and it's a cup of life. Well, we're going to stop there for today. And... Uh, we're going to keep going the next few weeks, look at these difficult questions, the controversial questions, the questions that make you ask, is that really in the Bible? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for your word, for the richness of it, for the depth of it. Uh, we thank you for Hebrews. Seems like uh, we were parked in Hebrews today. You've given us a snapshot of a new way. You've given us a snapshot of a new covenant, a new priesthood, a new priest, a new flavor of forgiveness, a new freedom, a new identity. And we just want to say thank you. We partook of this supper together. We celebrated together. The work of Jesus is awesome. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to go hunting and shopping for more, that we can bank on the fact that you've finished. You've done it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. I am not skilled to understand. Stands one who is my savior. I take him at his word and 
Christ died to save me the son and in my heart I find I need for him to be my savior that he would leave his place on high and come for sinful man to die you count it strange again and again that wow this book it's a book of life because it points to a person who is life it points to a person who is freedom it points to a person who is a life changer and so Jesus is our life changer because he's come in as the great life exchanger and he's taken out our heart of stone He's taken out our heart of flesh. He's taken out our mind that was opposed to God. And he's given us a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit, the great exchange. And so because change comes from exchange, we can celebrate this Jesus who's done it all. He's given us a new life, a life that we live from him, not doing our best for him. Have a great day.